Great. Um, would you say uh, a training camp for ADCC has officially begun? Uh, yeah, we do a 12-week camp for ADCC. June 17th was the official start of the 12-week camp. Um, just the aura of the room changes, uh, John's attitude changes, uh, the technique um, portion of the class is usually a lot more uh, intense. It's a lot more geared towards the ADCC standing uh, and ground integration between the two, um, a lot more standing rounds, a lot longer matches. Uh, so the, the whole dynamic of the training of the training room just changes. Uh, we added a training session um, where we were doing uh, just one longer session a day uh, and now we'll do you know, then we did the unofficial start of camp where we did uh, one shorter session in the morning and then a longer session in the afternoon. And we did the morning session Monday to Friday uh, and then the afternoon session seven days a week. And now <clears throat> at the official start of camp, now we just do the uh, 8 a.m. session and the 1 p.m. session seven days a week, every day, two, two sessions a day. Um, and uh, we run we run everything more more strict as the camp starts up and progresses towards the end. Yeah, so Nikki Rod's a great athlete. Um, the way that it's gonna be seated is going to be, I'm obviously gonna be, in the, gonna be the number one seed. Uh, Nikki Rod or Felipe Pena will be two and the other one will be three. So the way that they bracket it is one and four are always in the same side and then two and three are always in the same side. Uh, so. He'll be guaranteed to be on the opposite side of the bracket uh, from me. So he'll have to make it to the finals. I'll have to make it to the finals and then make can compete in the finals. Um, you know, he's very, very talented. Uh, he's, uh, he's super, super physical. Um, he's, he's definitely the most physical person I've ever trained with. Uh, very flexible, very explosive. Uh, he can move his body in, uh, in multiple different ways. He, a lot of people can either just bridge very well or contract very well in, into concave shoulders. He can do both very well. Uh, he can explode in a linear fashion uh, very very well. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely an issue to deal with the physicality. Um, I believe that Nicky Rod can beat anybody on that side of the bracket. Um, but I also believe that anybody on that side of the bracket could beat Nicky Rod. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of things that Nicky Rod does very well. Um, I think there's a lot of things that the other guys do very well, do uh, do very good as well. Um, but they're, all of them have all, you know, even myself, everyone has holes in their game. Um, and if those holes are exploited in the proper ways, uh, that'll end up determining the match. Um, so if we get to fight in the finals, I think it would be great. Um, I think it's a match that a lot of people uh, have wanted to see, especially after the, uh, the team split apart and now we're on, on two separate teams. Um, so if he makes it to the finals, uh, I would be, I'd be excited to fight him. I think, uh, I think it'll be a very interesting match. Uh, we've trained together a lot, so we know each other's games. Well, I'm, I'm sure he's different now. I'm obviously a lot different. I'm a completely different grappler than I was six months ago. So um, it's not going to be the same thing at all uh, grappling me. Um, but uh, he knows my game a lot better than the rest of the guys will. So um, it'll be, uh, it'll be a fun one for sure. Um, I prefer to compete against people that I've trained with because, uh, and I actually prefer to train with people who I know I'm going to compete against because I'm, I, I know for a fact that I can always learn their game and break down their game at a rate a hundred times faster than they can learn and break down my game. So if we do 10 sessions together, I'm gonna know everything about their game and they're gonna know very little about my game. And my, my game has so many layers and so much depth to it that at any point I can just change my game up and can play a completely different game and just play a completely different style of jiu-jitsu. Um, whereas most guys have like their one thing that they do and they don't really stray away from that. Uh, so it's usually pretty easy to, uh, to diagnose people's games because it's just one, two or three things that they're good at. And once you get past that, there's really not much there. Um, so I actually prefer to train with people who I might compete against because it always gives me a competition or uh, an edge in competition.
Um, I mean, you got to give it, there's two guys that come to mind. You got to give it to, uh, to Hadra and Marcelo. Um, you know, Hoffa is another one too, because I think Hoffa is the youngest champion. I think he's 19 and he won it. Um, so, and he's multiple time champion. So Hoffa Mendez definitely is up there. Um, but the two for me are Marcelo and Hadra because uh, Marcelo, um, <clears throat> Marcelo is the guy who has the highest submission rate ever in ADCC history. Um, he's a four time champion. He's been to the absolute finals multiple times. Like this guy is, has pretty much done it all besides win the absolute. Um, and uh, he actually probably would have won the absolute if uh, Andre and Drysdale didn't have a fake match and Andre beat uh, Drysdale. Uh, I think Marcelo would have beaten Andre at that point. Um, so Marcelo is definitely up there. Hodger, of course, is Hodger. Uh, you know, he's a three-time champion. He's the only guy to ever win double gold with eight out of eight submissions. He submitted everybody weight class and open weight. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's, he's Hodger. Um, so you got to give it to him. Um, and then, you know, my last one, uh, would be Andre. Um, the thing about Andre, I don't really like is his submission rate is very low. He plays like a kind of stally, like terrible to watch tactical game. Um, but he wins. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's the most winning champion ever in ADCC history. He's a six time champion. Uh, he, he did two ADCCs where he medaled and then he double golded and then he won four super fights. So he's a six time champion um, and uh, he's got the most gold medals out of anyone in ADCC history. So uh, the two big ones for me would be Marcelo and Hodger and then followed by that would be Andre and Hoffa. Do you see yourself being in the, the Hall of Fame as a, a goal or at least an inevitability? Uh, yeah, well, I would already be in the Hall of Fame if they were doing current uh, ADCC uh, current competitors. This this Hall of Fame, they're only doing uh, people who are retired. And Andre's the exception because Andre's retiring this year, so they're going to throw Andre in there as well. Um, but like people like me, like JT Torres, he's a two-time champion, two years in a row. Uh, Yuri Samoyes is uh, one of three guys to only win or to ever win uh, two separate weight divisions, and he won two years in a row. Um, so there's guys that that are still competing that should be in the Hall of Fame that aren't in there yet. Um, and, but uh, if they were doing active competitors and doing inducting them into the Hall of Fame, then they would be in the Hall of Fame as well. Well, I think that either number one, I think that flow grappling has to in itself become more mainstream because right now at ADCC, is the biggest event by far in Jiu Jitsu. Um, and Flo is the one who is broadcasting that. So I think Flo itself needs to go more like mainstream, like an ESPN, for example. Um, or at some point there needs to be a transition from like how the UFC went from Fox uh, to ESPN, um, where they had like this big, huge ESPN deal. Now they're you know, they're on ESPN with football and basketball and stuff like that. Um, so there, there needs to be a transition where you have grappling and ADCC specifically um, from a participant based sport, which doesn't really have that many eyes on it uh, to a spectator sport where just random people who don't train Jiu Jitsu are watching it. And it's, actually mainstream like right now we're a very niche sport um so we need to find a way and i think flow is doing a very good job with this i think that i think that flow can definitely be the people to take this mainstream um but i think right now it's just not mainstream um and part of it is the athletes a lot of the athletes are so goddamn boring that no one even wants to watch them so um it, it comes down to you know the streaming services and the promotion and the production value and the money that's thrown into the tournament, but you can't just be throwing millions of dollars away to create this tournament. And then the athletes only generate $10,000 in revenue because no one wants to watch them. So it's kind of a double-edged sword where the athletes need to generate the interest. And then if the athletes can generate the interest, then everyone else needs to do a good job of marketing it and promoting it and forcing it to be mainstream. So it's kind of a partnered approach between flow grappling and the athletes or whoever it's going to be and the athletes to kind of take it to the next level. It can't just be the athletes and it can't just be the streaming services and the marketing uh, promotions and things like that.
uh, Joe Rogan, I, I initially met actually through Flow. Um, I was competing against Wagner. You know, he had he was coming to the Who's Number Ones, and uh, he went to come see Wagner compete against. I forget who he was competing against, but Wagner competed against somebody, and he ended up winning. Uh, so, you know, Joe loves loves grappling, and he saw that the next show I was going to be fighting Wagner, and he was free that day, so he came and he watched me fight Wagner, and. Uh, and that was the time that I went out and competed against Wagner, um, who at the time was ranked number one in his weight class in the world um, when I fought him. And uh, I wrote in an envelope that I was gonna submit him with a triangle. I handed the envelope to the commentary table, and at the end I submitted him with a triangle and they opened it, and there was a triangle predicted in the envelope. Um, so then uh, Mike Sears actually from Flow introduced me to Rogan, and Rogan's like, yeah, let me know when you're back, I'll, I'll have you on the podcast. I was like, okay. So I was back in town. I came to do the podcast. And uh, that was a just terrible mistake because of the fact that I was so nauseous the whole time. It was like the worst interview I've ever given in my entire life. Um, so I just regret doing it completely because it was just so atrocious in my opinion that I just, I should have just waited till I was healthy. But actually, it actually helped me because so many people took notice of the fact that I had stomach issues that he, I actually had some people reach out and offer to help me that I actually got the help that I needed because of Joe um, with the Ways to All guys and my other doctor in California. So it actually ended up being a good thing. Um, but uh, so then I talked to him and we were living in Puerto Rico at the time. And uh, Joe has this thing where he just can't help himself from trying to convince all his friends to move to Austin. <laughs> so uh, I talked to him for like an hour about moving to Austin and, you know, he kind of kind of convinced me and I was like okay and then I was thinking about moving here or you know we're thinking about moving here and then uh the team split and then we just had limited training partners in Puerto Rico it was hard to open up a school and I was like all right fine let's let's go to Austin um so then, then I moved to Austin and then I became like pretty close with Joe I mean he's super busy so I don't bother him that much and you know he's got people don't realize how, how much stuff this guy does like he's got his family he's got his podcast which he does like four or five episodes a week. He does uh, the UFC, obviously, uh, the commentary. He does uh, comedy all over the country. So he's got four jobs right there. And he's all the other stuff that we don't even know about. Um, so this guy is just running around and just busy 24 hours a day. So uh, whenever I'm looking to hang out with him, uh, you know, we haven't seen each other in a while, I just tell him, I'm like, listen, what are you gonna be doing? Like, I'll stop by the studio and we'll, we'll chat for a little bit or uh, I'll come to see, you know, one of your, one of your stand up shows and then we'll go out and we'll do something. So I kind of try to work around his schedule because he's just like the busiest guy ever. And I know what it's like to a lesser degree. Um, like you just wake up and you have 50 million people just pulling you in every different direction. So I kind of try to work around his schedule. Um, so long story short, we became friends and, uh, you know, I was posting about sponsorships for ADCC and he like immediately, I posted about it on, on my Instagram and like within five minutes he texted me and he was like, I'll do whatever I have to do. Like, just let me, like, how can I sponsor you for ADCC? Like I want, I want Joe Rogan on there. And I was like, I was like, oh man, that's, that's incredible. Like, it's like the best text I could have got. Um, so I'm like, I'm like, you don't have to do anything, man. Like just send me, just send me the, the logo and it's on there. Like I'm not, I'm, I don't take money from my friends. Like. Uh, you know, I have like a lot of a lot of logos on here, um, like the Ouch Medi, um, the Ways to Well, BJJ Fanatics. Um, I have I have a lot of good friends on here. Most of these sponsors on here aren't sponsors; they're just friends that I support um, their businesses, and and Joe's one of them. So I, I told them I was like, listen, I don't want any money from you. Uh, you're a good friend of mine, and uh, I'm not gonna take your money to put my logo on the rash guard. So. Um, uh, I'll just I'll I'll just do it because we're friends. Um, and then I said, well, hey, also, you know, if you if you're looking to sponsor me, do you want me to have uh, you want me to ask ADCC if you can be an official sponsor for ADCC as well? Because um, I could set that up. And he's like, oh yeah, that would be awesome. So then we kind of talked, and uh, I introduced him to Mo, and then uh, you know, they uh, they came to whatever deal they they decided on. But uh, yeah, it's it's also it's awesome just to be able to uh, to go out and not only just support my friends, but uh, just to represent the biggest podcast in the world, um, I think it's pretty cool. The number one thing that sticks with me as far as advice that I've been given is a, is a one line from John. And he told me when I was 16, 17 years old, that 
if you just focus on being the best in the world at whatever you do, everything else is easy. He's like, the, and that was it. And then he continued and he was like, you know, the marketing is easy, shit talking is easy, being unique is easy. He's like, that stuff's all easy, anybody can do that. He's like, the most important thing is that you just focus every day on being the best in the world. So you can go out, you can perform, and you can actually win tournaments consistently against the highest level guys over the course of years, decades, through multiple generations. He's like, if you just focus on being the best in the world, the rest of it's easy. He's like, everyone tries to do it backwards. They get to a certain level and they try to push their brand, but their brand isn't strong enough to sustain them through the course of time. He's like, just keep focused on being the best in the world and then everything else will fall into place. And that kind of just changed the way I thought about everything. I just, I focus on being an athlete first ever since then and everything else is kind of second place. Is that in your mind pretty much every day when you train? Is that something that drives you? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just like an overcasting theme of my life um, where you know, no matter what, like, you know, you feel shitty, you get up, you come train, like, you're depressed about something, you're upset about something, you're mad about something, you just get up and you go train. Um, so this is like the one kind of default in my life where, you know, no matter what, you know, if I have to miss a lifting session or something to go get my car registered, I'll do it. But I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be training at least at least once a day, every day. I'm an ADCC. Um, I have a few different tricks in the standing position, uh, position that I think people will be uh, surprised by. Um, and then uh, I have a lot of new guard passing stuff I've been working on. I know it's gonna be hard to get these big guys to accept bottom position. And to be honest, most big guys are in this division have terrible bottom position. So it'll probably just be like very basic stuff. Like I'll just lay on top of them and just fall into half guard chest to chest and then pass their guards. Um, but should a big guy have a good guard, um, or well, like if I get when I get Andre on bottom, for example, um, then I'll, I'll I'll debut some of my new passing stuff. Maybe um, well you'll see it in the Penna match because he's gonna be playing on bottom. Uh, but uh, I have some new stuff. I, I mean, from the last ADCC until now, I'm just a totally different grappler altogether. So there's definitely some new stuff you'll see. Um, almost all of it has been for me identifying weaknesses in my own game and trying to close those those gaps and those holes. Um, that's what, uh, one thing that I think separates champions and people who are just regular people. Um, the, the champions will always look at themselves from a different uh, from a different perspective from a third person and ask themselves. I ask myself all the time if I was going to beat Gordon Ryan, how would I do it? And I answer that question. And if I say, I would beat Gordon by doing this, congratulations, you just pointed out a hole in your own game and you should work over the next, however many weeks, months, or years it takes to fix that hole and to, to get it to a point where it rises to the same level as the rest of your game. Um, so right now I know how I would beat myself uh, if I had to compete against myself at ADCC. Um, and, uh, it's a very limited window to be able to beat me, uh, but it is possible. Um, so I'm working now and I've been working um, on ways to make sure that those holes aren't exploited or by the time ADCC comes around that I don't even have those holes anymore. I'm, I'm just all around good everywhere. So my name is Tim Kennedy. I have been doing jujitsu since I was but a wee child. Um, jujitsu has changed my life uh, it's actually saved my life. It's not only probably kept me out of prison uh, from dying from AIDS and a variety of other, other, other terrible things, but also coming back from war, it is like the most cathartic. It's like yoga, but you get to strangle somebody. Oh, yeah. So it's like saved my soul. What about you? Oh, 20 years of jiu-jitsu. What's your name? Sean Apperson. Mm -hmm. um, also uh, got involved in the business of jiu-jitsu, so it's been in livelihood for a long time. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to watch people change and really grow in the sport so it's unbelievable uh any competitions coming up that you're looking forward to either competing in or just watching as a spectator uh so uh john danaher and i were just talking i i, I cornered for roy mcdonald this last weekend and um i've been struggling to find time to train for the past 
few months, uh, it's just been absolutely bonkers. So my, my training time has been like really early or really late. And uh, after August, I'm gonna have free time again. And we're looking at competing in late fall. January. Yeah, or early uh, midwinter. What kind of a competition do you think it'll be? The strangling and tapping people kind. <laughs> the good kind. What's it like training with Gordon? How long have you uh, been training with Gordon? And do either of you have any uh, memorable experiences or your favorite Gordon story? Memorable. Memorable. Oh, yeah. We wear these uh, heart rate monitors and, uh, you know, I grew up wrestling. So I was like, oh, on the feet, I'll have some kind of advantage. And um, it was like a 15 minute round. It was supposed to be a 15 minute round. But that's just John, like just watching until he gets tired of watching. So, you know, Gordon's going full on and hand fighting and he's hand fighting super good. I had no idea. So also I look up and I'm like in the red, my heart rate's like 96%. And it was like two minutes in and it was <laughs> the gnarliest round of like, he's trying to work on trips. And then as I get up, kind of like letting me up and then tripping me again and then dropping all of his weight and then kind of toying around and like letting me scramble a little, like get halfway up and then you'll get back to my back and his foot sweeps are unbelievable. So it was like, it was a waterboarding experience of just pain and misery. And then just whenever John, I don't know, I might've just went on for 20 minutes, but my heart, like looking at my strap, it was just red. Just a solid stretch. Uh, the first time I rolled with Gordon, he was he, he was literally a child, and uh, maybe he's 17 years old, 18, and he just come from New York. And um, I'm playing with him at the on, on the on it mats, and I'm like, who who is this person? Who how like he was doing things, and you know it, it was like a 20 30 minute round that no position landed no it was just constant me trying to survive with this young man you know and um you know fast forward 10 years where now i walk out on these mats and uh it is it is it is a moment to reevaluate who you are as a martial artist you know and and if you came in here with an ego it first of all won't exist but more importantly like it it recalibrates and reshapes well, everything that you know about jujitsu, or you thought that you knew about jujitsu, uh, being able to train with him is is um, man, it's like magic. Who do you think is the most dominant uh, jujitsu practitioner today, and, and how have they changed the game? This is a this is a trick question. Yeah. Fine. Well, I think watching what John's done, where just his coming up at Hinzo with so many great grapplers and being able to like be in that early age where the gi was coming off like in the late 90s and it wasn't coming off in a lot of areas. And they had that solid core of like Matt, Nikki, Sarah, and Rodrigo, Gracie, and uh, John was there at that early time developing techniques and then he just constantly developed and he just has that inquisitive mind where he's always trying to improve. And then he's got this young group of talented athletes that want to just devote their whole life to jiu-jitsu. It was like a perfect timing. And um, yeah, it's like a, a marriage made in heaven, I guess. So I think Gordon and, and John and what they've done is very innovative and pretty remarkable in the sport. Yeah, I mean, um, or, you know, you're coming off of the era of Padre Gracie and Marcelo Garcia and Chandra Ribeiro. Um, it's, it has, I think there's no question that right now, if you said who's the best pound for pound fighter on the planet, who's the most dominant grappling uh, practitioner, like you're gonna look to Gordon. Gordon's at the very top of that list and the disparity between him and number two is huge. Like that, that Delta is, um, there's like him and then there's everyone else that starts way down here. Um, but that's the thing about Jiu Jitsu and that's the beauty of this sport is how fast it evolves and how quickly people innovate. Fortunately, most of that innovation is happening right behind us. Um, but just like the magic happened with Danaher and the team, that magic can happen anywhere. Um, you know, that the timing is gonna be right somewhere else, hopefully. You, know, like you look at AK and you look at uh, a Brazilian top team, an American top team, and Jackson, Winkle John, and uh, you know, these, these big fight camps. They're at the right place, the right time, with the right people, and something great happens. Uh, they made champions. Well, that's that's happened with John and his team, and that's happened with Gordon and and everyone that he trains with. Uh, but it's jujitsu. Super fight. Ready for another trick question? 
Who, who wins and uh, how do you think they do it? Who's fighting? A guy. I'm kidding. A guy. <laughs> you might know him, Gordon and uh, Gavao. Huh? Oh. Man, I don't think, um, like, I've known Gavao for a long time. I, I don't see, I mean, I'd love it if he shows up. Yeah. I, if I were a betting man, him showing up. Indeed. Yeah, s something. I'm going to say 50 50. You know, uh, if he's on the, those mats, Gordon's going to absolutely run through him. He's going to run through him. Like, it, you know, like when you're running, like a superhero run, and then you like hit a fence, but you never actually change your tempo of what you're running. You just like run through something, and then you like run through a brick wall. Like, that's what it's going to look like. He would literally just like move. And you're like, is that a match? Uh, yeah. Yeah. His advantage on the feet, I think, is everywhere. I mean, his advantage is everywhere. So, and his conditioning and his strength and his. Relentless attacks. Um, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough for Andre. Chillin', thank you so much. Yeah. Have a beautiful day. <laughs>